Welcome to the Possibility Action Network podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Middleton, a.k.a. Possibility Man. We're committed to bringing you guests who strive to better people's lives and serve as a force for good in the world. Our guest today is Dr. Linda Way Greenwood. She's board certified in family medicine and mind-body medicine. She's the founder and CEO of Total well- Renaissance Wellness. She's also been the clinical director at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. She is a physician with a wide range of experience and expertise, including serving as a doctor with John Hopkins Community Physicians. She offers the full scope of family medicine with expertise in areas including women's health, preventative medicine, and behavioral medicine. She also practiced medicine at the White River Apache Indian Reservation. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Family Practice. She is a sought after public speaker and has presented at colleges and universities, the National Institute of Health, professional meetings at the Bon Secours Retreat Center in Maryland, and much, much more. On top of all of this, Dr. Greenwood is an author. Dr. Linda Way Greenwood, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much, Dr. Middleton. And I do have to make one correction. I served as the Associate Clinical Director at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. We, they okay, have a great. wonderful clinical director, and I wouldn't want to take anything away from her. But thank okay. you so much for that beautiful introduction. Uh huh. Well, thank you for making that correction for us. Uh, you have just so much going on. I didn't want to miss anything out. So, yeah. Um, but look, first, I have a lot of questions to talk with you about, to ask you. But first, just note to our listeners and our viewers, follow, like, and share this podcast wherever you find it in order for us to get guests like Dr. Greenwood, we really need to have you here. So thank you for being with us, Dr. Greenwood. So My pleasure. Look, um, this is the Possibility Action Network, and we're always curious in knowing how people become who they are in the world. So I'm going to take you back. At what point in your early education did you become, did you consider becoming a physician? Yes. Well, um, that's not hard for me to think about. It was really at eight years old. I decided that I wanted to become a physician. Um, At the time, I was really enamored with science and I was taking a special science course and I loved babies and children. And so I was like, how can I marry these two um, passions of mine? And I thought, oh, I'll be a children's doctor. And then that, that kind of was the seed that was planted in me. And I've stayed that course ever since. Wow. You know, that's amazing. So now are you, uh, are you from a family of medical doctors, parents, uh, you know, siblings? Uh, I'm just kind of curious how, where that came from. Not at all. Not at all. Um, No one else is a doctor in the family. Um, I do though, my beloved aunt um, who passed uh, last year, she was a nurse. Um, and my grandmother and my mother-in-law were um, nursing assistants. So um, I've always, I guess I've been around medical. And I want to say that my grandfather worked uh, in mental health as well. So I've been around that, but um, no one else is a physician. Uh huh. So now how would you explain this? I mean, this is a great, deep insight for an eight-year-old. I mean, is it like uh, divine? Is it like from the universe? I mean, how would you explain it? (laughs) I don't know. Because depending on what day you ask me, I'm like, is this from the universe? Or is this something? (laughs) Did I take a U-turn? But um, I don't know. Um, It's definitely, um, like I said, it was started as more like, what do do I like? And um every step of the way there were little things that would kind of um, reconfirm those likes. Um, I remember, like I said, I was in special science and then I had a really cool um, science teacher in middle school. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that movie school of rock, but the, the guy who I cannot um, Jack black, he does all this crazy stuff and he dresses up and he gets the kids really excited I had like the real live version of that. And he Mm. would make up songs about mold 
and mold in your underwear and stuff that the, as kids we thought was so funny. And just as I went on and then in, in high school um, in Howard County, which is where I'm at, they had um, something called the mentor program. And in the mentor program, they would match you with someone in the community who was doing what you were interested in. Mm -hmm. And so when that um, happened for me, I started doing working in a lab at, at the time it was called MarTech um, Corporation. And um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I'll just say mm -hmm. along, along the way, there were a lot of things that were kind of fall into place that kind of reconfirmed my love and my like for medicine. Yeah, I just want to underscore um, a couple of things that you said in, in those remarks. One is follow what you love. That's important, isn't it? it for anyone, any career. For sure, for yeah. sure. Um, the best advice that I was given um, in medical school was not to pick my specialty based upon my aptitude, I actually mm -hmm. just said this to a, a budding young um, medical student. It was to follow what I was passionate about. And yeah. I thought that that advice has carried me um, throughout the years greatly because there were things that I was good at, but they weren't necessarily what I was passionate about. And I mm -hmm. think in the midnight hour, especially in medicine, when things get rough and tough and you want to give up and you don't want to, you're like, I can't, I can't take another step. It's that passion that's going to fuel you and drive you. Yeah, 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 that's great. Um, and I just want to underscore what you said about teachers. I mean, this is something that all teachers need to be aware of. A teacher can make a huge difference for students. Oh my gosh. For yeah. sure, for sure. Um, I'll share with you, I was having um, some challenges in a course in medical school and I decided to withdraw from it because I didn't want mm. to... Um, get a bad grade. And so I decided to take it over the summer. And that course that was like kind of the bane of my existence at that time, when I went to take it over the summer, the teacher, like I remember walking into the room, he was barefoot. He was sitting down <laughs> with his legs crossed in the middle of the floor. And I was like, who is this guy? And can I just tell you what I didn't know is that he would take me on an, a journey with microbiology mm. over the next four weeks that made me love, love something that started off as the bane of my yeah. existence and then became my favorite and still is to my, is my favorite subject. So yeah. it, the teacher really can make a difference. Right. I want to just give a shout out to teachers for that reason, you know, because yeah. I, when I went to college, I didn't even know that history was a thing mm -hmm. until I met a teacher who just turned my life upside down. <laughs> it's just amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So teachers make a difference. So now, you you know, and you were clearly a brilliant student, uh, Dr. Greenwood. And I say that because, you know, you went to the, the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And if I'm correct, you were, and is it pronounced Eccles Scholar? Yes. Yes. That's wow. a special scholarship program they have there. They take the top 7% of uh -huh. the class that enters and what's, what this program really is, is they have us in a couple of dorms. So we're kind of all around each other, although I opted to be in a dorm with um, some Echo scholars, some non-Echo scholars. But they basically let you, it, it doesn't, um, you do not have to declare a major. So mm -hmm. the benefit of that is you're allowed to take uh, graduate level coursework and mm -hmm. you're allowed to take, you don't have a, have a defined um, scope of courses that you took. So I had a ball with that. I took metaphysics. I took archaic cult and myth, all these things that normally when you're just straight pre-med and nothing wrong, shout out to all my pre-med people, but um, you would be on a prescribed course. I had to take those things in order to be able to get into medical school. But then I also had my schedule was freed up to take a lot of things that I normally would not have been able to take. Mm -hmm. And I'm forever grateful for that. It was a great, you know, I like that. I like that type of schedule. So what, what, what were your metaphysics studies like and how did metaphysics oh impact your life at that time and it impacts your life today? Well, the metaphysics class um, was, it was amazing because someone like me, who's kind of like a, um, a thought geek, um, we would really just sit and ponder things, honestly. Mm. Um, like, for instance, 
is when I see red, the same red when you see red, like we we say that a color is red, but yeah. if I were to jump into your body, would actually what you know of as red really be my blue? <laughs> yeah, and so yeah. we would like discuss these things for you know the whole class and just talk about just perspectives, you know, and 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 the the framework with which how we come at this life. So mm -hmm. it was really opened my eyes to understanding that there's a whole world out there and it's how we're experiencing it is different for different people. Yeah, I want to unpack that a little more when I talk with you about behavioral medicine, because that intrigues me as well. I want to see what you have to say about that. But now, you know, so you went on to medical, you knew you were going to go to medical school, such a year so. Mm -hmm. um, so in medical school, though, how did you come to your specialty as a family medicine doctor? How did that happen for you? So again, um, easy for me to answer because when you, the first two years, at least how it was structured when I was going through, I'm a little bit of a, um, a old head now. Uh, they, they've probably changed some things. Um, but you, the first two years were academic. So you do all your book studies. And I remember coming in and the syllabus was like this big. I thought it was my textbook. It was my syllabus. Um, wow. <laughs> and the, so that's the first years you learn the basic sciences and the pharmacology. And then the last two years, excuse me, you um, are in the clinic. You do the, your clinical rotations. And every time I would go on a rotation, I would still be, every time I go to a new rotation, I'd still be stuck in the old rotation. So we would, I would do OB and I would deliver, you know, a certain set of babies or, you know, assist in that. And then I'd go on to surgery and I'd be still wondering, I'd be asking my teachers, well, what happened to baby so-and-so, you know, what's going on with that? And so then I'd go on to surgery and then from there I go to neurology and I'd still want to, you know, check in and look up and see how is Mr. So-and-so doing from that surgery. And so coupled with that advice that I talked about earlier, um, cause I really had a surgical aptitude. I'm very detail oriented and, and, you know, dexterity wise, that was kind of something that I was, but personality wise, Every rotation I went in, I enjoyed and I wanted that continuity of care. And that's what family mm -hmm. medicine is. You're taking care, we always say from birth to the grave, you're taking care mm -hmm. of families, you get to know them, they're coming back to you regularly. It was right up my alley because everybody was mm -hmm. like, you want to be, you need to be a family medicine because you're always trying to figure out what happened to the people you've already touched. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah. That's how I came to do family medicine. I'm hearing a lot of that metaphysical thing that you've been talking about showing up there as well. Hey, look, so what is it like, you know, being a medical student, let's say the first year, the second year when you're doing a lot of coursework, what is that like? It's very, very challenging. Um, it's, it's funny because that first semester, you know, we kind of used to hang out and party with the um, law students and the dental students. And by that second semester, you, nobody was partying. We were not hanging out. We were not doing much, much social. Um, it again, the way it was structured back then, there's um, there's just a lot of study. There's a lot mm -hmm. of um, late nights. You're up. You spend the night in classes often. Um, you know, in labs and things like that. But I will say we had probably out of a a. Um, I don't know, maybe 170, 165 ish class, you know, um, there were a group of us that were very close and we looked out for each other and mm -hmm. um, would make sure that we were all, you know, attending class and doing okay. Um, and just making sure that everyone was on, on task for what they needed to do. But mm -hmm. you, you lose the, the, the second part of medical school, was much, much more enjoyable to me because um, being a people person, I that's when I could touch people. That's when I could get in there and I could see, oh, this is what medicine about. Reading about it was not the same. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, you you mentioned your clinical rotations by your third year, was it? By your third year? Yes. Um, so, and, and, and you mentioned uh, either participating and delivering babies or delivering babies by your third year? 
Yeah, and well, your your job as a medical student is to assist in whatever is going mm -hmm. on. So whatever rotation mm -hmm. you're on within your scope of what you're allowed to do, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I say delivering babies, you know, maybe I'm holding someone's leg or I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, checking running things back and forth for the doctor. I mean, right. you're doing things within your scope. And then as you move through, like in residency, yes. In residency, I actually have delivered 50 babies because yeah, that's yeah. part of, you know, family yeah. medicine. Yeah. What What is it like? You know, I'm going to use the word catching a baby. What is that like? What was that like it's, for you? It's terrifying and um, the most amazing thing you'll ever do. So mm -hmm. it's it's like two things in one. I mean, they're very squirmy. They're little and they're slippery and you're just mm -hmm. praying that you, you don't, you know, nothing goes wrong. Um, but you're also a part of one of the most significant and amazing things that can happen in someone's life. Yeah. You know, I, I want to stay with this medical education for a moment. You're, you're in the room, whether you're delivering babies or a doctor along with you and other students, you know, doing surgery. What, what, what if, if you can go back, what, what was your thinking about the human body and about how this thing works and our connect connection to the whole, to the whole? Did anything show up like that for you? Like that you went into, wow. Um, yeah, it's an awe-inspiring experience. I will, I will say, and this is not just with um delivering a baby, but I my personal belief system in spirituality became much more fortified and certified, interestingly enough, after being in um, medical school. Um, yeah. You know, it's kind of a juxtaposition. It's very scientific and very clinical. But, um, you know, for me, after being in the uh, anatomy lab and, and delivering and, and being part of deliveries and seeing surgeries and all of that, I just became very much aware of just the awe of what yeah. it is to be human, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah, I, I tell you, it, it, it amazes us too as patients. It is like, whoa, that's amazing. So look, I want to look at some of your subspecialties because you get a couple, you have a lot of interests. And I just want to want you to open the door to what it means and then we'll deep, take a deeper dive as we continue talking. Um, what drew you to women's health beyond yourself being a woman if if there's something else that drew you to that yeah i um well like you said obviously i i'm i'm a woman and i identify as a woman and so i think you are attracted to things that affect you that's the first mm -hmm. thing but i'm also i'm um an underdog person so i feel like um, I really like in my clinical career and just again, for clarification, I am, I'm, I'm pretty much semi-retired clinically now. Okay. Um, when I was practicing and seeing patients regularly, that's mm -hmm. was kind of my specialties. I really have always been attracted to groups that I feel like are not always as representative represented mm -hmm. as they can be. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of people don't love working with teens and adolescents. I loved working with them. Yeah. I think that that's yeah. a great time. You can kind of help shape them. You can talk to them in a way that can maybe, you know, even I kind of tried to intersperse in my visits, you know, talking to them about their futures and, you mm. know, um, being able to follow their dreams um, with women. You know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of times, there are elements in women's health that gets forgotten. And I think it's yeah. important for a woman to hear from another woman, you know, things that are going on with us. And so, yeah. you know, whether that be hormone health or that be, um, you know, going through menopause or fertility, all of those things, I think don't always get the, um, the airtime that they should. Yeah. And let me just say this, this is always my philosophy as a doctor. And it's probably the opposite of my philosophy anywhere else outside of the exam room. But um, it's the one place that I do feel like people should have a right to be with people that they feel most comfortable with. So mm -hmm. I am totally fine 
Um, you know, I'm very confident in who I am as a practitioner. And like I used to tell people, I said, you know, I personally love pineapple. Mm -hmm. Pineapple's a great fruit. Um, but you might hate pineapple. Does that mean anything's no. wrong with pineapple? Not at all. It just no. means you don't like pineapple. I like pineapple. And I kind of, and I know that's very simplistic, but I feel that way when it comes to your provider. I think that if you're someone, you're a male and you want to see a male, you should see a male. If you want to see someone who's younger, you should see someone who's younger. If you want to see someone who's older. I just think that what's most important to me is that you feel comfortable with me as a provider or that if you're not my patient, you're feeling comfortable with your provider. That's a very personal relationship yeah. and it's something and it's a partnership. It's not just a relationship, it's a partnership or it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that. I, I get it for sure. Um, look, I want to throw out another one. You've already mentioned ad adolescent care. Um, uh, behavioral medicine, if I can put it that way, is also an area of interest for you. And when I saw that, I wondered, hmm, what attracted you? What, what draws you to that uh, in your past practice? And and the way you work, because you work with patients in a lot of ways today. We'll get to mm -hmm. that later. Yeah. What, 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 what opened that up for you? Because some people, Dr. Greenwood would like say, you know, I don't want to open that door. But right. you open that door. You know, yeah, what, what draws you? Um, well, I love thinking about how people think. I love mm. thinking about what makes people tick. Um, to me, you know, there's such an, an it's so important to have an understanding of what is going on with someone from a, a cognitive, from a brain stance? Yeah. Um, that's why I love mind-body medicine, um, my true mm -hmm. passion, because all of it, it's it's connected. You know, this is not separate from this, the heart, you know, which is not separate from this, the outer parts. And so um, I think it's something, I, I don't, going back to that underdog, I think the behavioral yeah. medicine piece is an underdog. People don't spend enough time on it. They don't think enough about it. Um, if you're upset about something, if you are um, ruminating on something, if you have frustrations, it's going to affect your day. It's going to affect how you interact with people. I mean, I don't know if this happened to you. You ever been on the road and people are driving erratically or just acting? Yeah. I mean, I always think to myself, I wonder what's going on with that person, yeah. you know? That's, that's, right. that's, and it's taught me to deal with my relationships and to attack the different problems and the challenges that come into my life is from that lens of trying to understand what is underneath whatever it is I'm seeing or experiencing. So I'm just, yeah. I, I love behavioral medicine. I think it's important and I think it's undervalued to some extent. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that as a doctor that you uh, are interested in that and are paying attention to because you doctors see a lot of patients. And many of these patients, right, who walk into a doctor's office may be having not only a physical symptom, but also an emotional symptom. For sure. And doctors need to be able to recognize that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you mentioned um, considering what may be happening to a person who's simply driving a car. I'm just throwing this out at you because I've had that experience. I'm driving and I don't know where I'm going, so therefore I'm pretty attentive to it. Someone just hit their horn, blowing like crazy. And I've asked my question, I wonder what's going on with that person. I hope they they were okay. Because there's something going on with that person, right? Sure. It's not just the person who's driving in front of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's always something underlying what someone is yeah. doing. You know, and that's again where, and I know we'll talk about this later, but that's where my love for mind body medicine comes in because there's yeah. there's a foundation of those things that that kind of play into how we experience each other in the world. Yeah. Okay. And we'll get deeper uh, and to let you, allow you to unpack that in a moment, but I just want to open the door. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy when I saw this part of your work. You know, it's like food. Uh, or or food as medicine. I said, whoa, she's on it. Doctor, what intrigues you about that? Because that's a hot topic these days. Yeah, well, first of all, I am a self-proclaimed foodie. I am a cook. I am um, a gardener. I grow food. Um, and so I, anything with food and nutrition is exciting to me. I, 
Mm. When I was a younger adult, I would um, I would read so many cookbooks, diet books, all those kind of things. That's just always been something that's um, exciting and interesting to me. And so um, the Center for Mind Body Medicine had an entire course called Food is Medicine and Cancer Guides. Um, they it's it's in it's kind of um, what what should I say? I don't want to call it being defunct, but it's um, it's just not an active program right now. I would say, mm -hmm. but at the time, um, they were advertising this Food is Medicine program, and it was in Baltimore at the time, and I went there. And when I tell you it was like a dream, it really was. It had top-notch chefs, um, nu nutritional director. Um, it had um, all kinds of uh, workshops and trainings on food. And mm -hmm. it, it really, food really is the medicine. I have a, I have a um, talk that I give on food as medicine. And mm -hmm. food really is the medicine. Um, and it's interesting because um, a long time ago, that was very well known. We knew that what we ingested directly affected our physiology and had a lot of um, influence over how we felt. I mean, case in point, have you ever eaten something and immediately afterward you felt sleepy? Mm -hmm. That has happened to me. Yeah. Or you've eaten something and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm wide awake. I'm that is, you know, that sounds so simplistic, but that's literally what we're doing to ourselves two, three, four, depending on how many times you eat, four times a day. The the nutrients that we're putting into our bodies is sending signals. It's activating hormones. It's giving us nutrients and it's telling our bodies to do certain things. So yeah. like some people will say, you know, I can't eat sugar because it makes me, you know, X, Y, Z. Well, that's, that's literally happening to you on a cellular level. And so for me, it was really just a natural, um, it was just natural for me to gravitate toward coursework that um, taught about that. And so, and then the out kind of the, the extension of that is wanting to cook good food and yeah. wanting to grow good food and wanting to have a better understanding of what are the things I'm putting into my body and how they, how my body reacts to it. Yeah. I, look, as a patient, you know, I think it's so wonderful to have a doctor who has an interest in not only, you know, my body, you know, physical in terms of symptoms, but also my mind and, and the natural things that can help my body function better. Oh, there's an example of you know, of this food as medicine thing. You're gonna chuckle at this. When I eat certain foods, I digest better. I eliminate on schedule. If sure. I eat the wrong foods, it's like being in, in Chicago during rush hour. If, if you get yes. what I'm saying, <laughs> absolutely, a hundred percent. And that's the thing. Like when we when I teach people about food as medicine, or I do my intro to food as medicine talk. We talk about that. We talk about having, you know, have seven days where you eat only organic or have seven days where you, you know, eliminate something from your diet that maybe, you know, is not doing well with you. So, because the food is information. It's giving mm. your body information and the outcome is information. So, you know, people will say, oh, I can't have chocolate because it causes headaches, you know, or... I know for myself, I can't eat uh, concentrated sweets after a certain hour or I'm going to wake up sweating. That's just mm -hmm. at, at this age, <laughs> um, my body just does not break down sugar like that. So, I mean, if there's all people who can't eat, you know, um, gluten or, you know, they can't have too much bread because it's going to make them feel bloated. I mean, all of those things are really important. And I think also, and this is a whole nother topic it's also giving us information about the way our food is processed. You know, yes. we didn't have as many of these problems, you know, back in the day, my grandmother lived to be 105.5. And honestly, wow. she ate very, very, very little processed food. She would make mm -hmm. her own candy. I don't think she had pizza until she was like in her eighties and she walked everywhere and she would have told you butter and whole butter, garlic, and dare I say she ate the the a uh, pig from the rooter to the tutor 
and she <laughs> but she was in great health and yeah. I'm, it's not that I'm you know knocking anybody who doesn't eat certain food groups or you know if you're you're you know I've been vegan myself I've been a lot of different things but the point I'm trying to make is I think the way our food is processed is also affecting us um mm -hmm. those little uh, disclaimers on the boxes. We kind of don't know what that means. Yeah. I mean, that, that's something to, that's, that's something to think about. And the other thing that I really yeah. want to make sure that I leave with you is that a lot of people don't understand that there is a super highway between the brain and the gut. Mm -hmm. So it was always kind of thought if you were feeling a certain kind of way, it might affect what, how your stomach feels. So, you know, if you're feeling mm -hmm worried or you're anxious your stomach might feel a certain way but there's also that is a two-way biofeedback loop if mm -hmm. you put things in your stomach that your that your body doesn't like it also sends signals back up to your brain as well yeah so it can great. literally affect your mood your food affects your mood and we had mm -hmm. a course called mind mood and food wow i love it we also yeah. did take that course yes yeah. so look, i mean you know Convenience food, you and I are in the United States, other folks are in different parts of the world. Convenience food, it, well, they are convenient, but what do you, I mean, are they always good for us? Are they the right choices for our bodies? What do you think? That's, I love that you brought that up because part of my um, talk on food as medicine is talking about disparities and talking about inclusion in different groups. And so what the problems that we have here in the U.S., are not the same problems you have in another country. And a uh, point that really brings this home, um, I have a wonderful colleague at the Center for Mind Body Medicine because I'm uh, still on faculty there and I'm a supervisor there. And um, she's from South Sudan. And I was doing the food as medicine talk for the center and she was coming behind me and she wanted me to talk, you know, share some of my notes. And it was interesting. She was saying how in her country, like in my talk, I'm saying, you know, go back to the land, you know, grow your own food, leave processed food away. And she was like, nobody in my audience would want to hear that. You know, mm -hmm. for us, she was saying growing from the land is almost considered like, you know, poor man's uh, uh, doing or or wow. um, it's just people want to be able to experience processed food and it was really eye-opening to me because I was like you know we can't always take what are our problems or even a uh, body image or what's considered beautiful you know so I don't really talk to people about weights or you know what you should look like because in other cultures what is what is beautiful or what is healthy or what is celebrated could be different than what we have here so That's um sure. I don't know if I answered your question but um yeah I mean it all depends on what your culture is and what that processing looks like. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Greenwood, what is it like practice or treating patients? Let me ask that. What is it like treating patients? What is that like for you? Um, it's um, exhilarating. It's a lot of fun. It's terrifying. It's frustrating. It's yeah. it's. It's no different than anything you would do where you have to work with people. You have all different kinds of people. I have had thousands of patients over my career. Um, some of them had have made me feel my best on my worst days. And then you have a few that will make you feel <laughs> your worst on your best days. I mean, that's just tr true, true talk. But I mean, overall, um, it has given me the experience of a lifetime to work with patients. Mm -hmm. And what I found and, you know, it almost feels a little otherworldly, but whatever mm -hmm. was going on in my life, that's what patients would show up. So let's just say I wanted a new business venture. Every patient that would come in that week would be an entrepreneur or someone who has opened a business or something like that. Yeah. Um, I remember um, I have three children and there's a large split in age with them. So my youngest is 10 and my oldest is 23. And I remember when I was pregnant with the youngest, I was worried, you know, would they have a relationship? The, the, yeah. the, the, all three of them. Um, uh, and the other one is 13. So 10, 13 and 23. And I swear every patient that would come in would be, they'd have that split and they would share that with me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the, 
your patients almost become your family, some of them. And I just, that, that is the, that part I miss. I miss having an open audience, my own, you know, little focus group <laughs> every, yeah. every week of whatever was come going on in my life. Well, that's a little bit of metaphysical uh, that, you, that you just shared. What's the hardest part, Dr. Greenwood, of diagnosing a health condition? Um, well, to me, if you're doing the job right, mm -hmm. you are compassionate and, and I'm an empath and you, you see a little bit of yourself in your patients. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the hardest part is just the worry and the anxiousness that you get, no matter how long you've been doing it, that you're doing what's best for your patient and wanting to get it right so that no one is suffering or that, you know, if there's something we don't know what it is, you want to make sure you get the patient to the right person. Mm -hmm. But I had a, a a mentor very early on, um, someone I used to shadow with who told me, you know, at the time she said, I've been in, um, in practice at the time, she said 30 years. And she's like, you know what? I make mistakes every day. She's like, I'm sure of it. Some of them I know about, some of them I don't. She's like, but I've never been sued in 30 years, you know why? Because I care about my patients and I make yeah. sure my patients know that no matter what we do as part of their healthcare journey, I'm in, I'm in this with them. And I took that and I took that on, um, as, as, as the way that I practice medicine. In fact, my tagline was ca comprehensive care with a compassionate flair. And oh, so I, I really, um, think that, if, like I said, if you're doing it right, you have some angst because you want to make sure that you're doing it correctly. But um, and then that's on that same coin, you know, patients sometimes are not always um, they don't always show that same grace back to you. There's mm -hmm. almost been created an us versus them mentality when yeah. it comes to your doctor. You know, they're the rich doctor. They just want to take my money. They just want to. <laughs> and it's like so far from the truth. I, I mean, I'm I'm on the front lines of medicine. I'm not, I always tell people, I'm not the, you know, gray haired uh, person driving around the Porsche. I'm, I'm, I'm on the front lines. And so, um, yeah, but I think it's important to establish yeah. a good yeah. rapport and relationship with your patients so that you don't have to, to feel that. And then lastly, I would say it's always hard when you have to deliver bad news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's wonderful when, when a doctor, though, uh, endeavors to empower the patient, a lot of patients to be a part of, as opposed to sit down or you, you know, just listen to me and shut up. I don't hear what you have to say. <laughs> you don't seem to be one of those doctors. No, not at all. No, not at all. Because my famous saying is um, most patients aren't doctors, but all doctors are patients. So oh. you've, you've got to remember that. You have to remember yeah. that. And in fact, um, the first book that I wrote, and I'll, I'll tell you, it's not the best book because at the time it was my first uh, stab at it, but I, I still stand behind it. It's called The Insider's Guide to Good Health Care. It's on Amazon. Mm -hmm. But that was the basis of that book is that people would come to me and they would ask all these questions. And I was like, gosh, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people who felt like, oh, I wish I had a doctor at the table that I could just kind of shoot the breeze with and ask these questions. I mean, look at all the questions you've had for me. Yeah. And a lot of times in that little seven minutes, 10 minutes that you have with your doctor, you often don't have the time to, to, to ask the questions um, that you want. So it's important for you to give your patients time to speak and time yeah. to ask questions and time to come back. And that's actually something that I do as part of my current practice. Um, there's a piece of my practice that's medical advocacy where I, and in yeah. fact, I just did it over this weekend, where I speak on behalf of families and individuals who don't always know the right questions to ask yes. for their, yeah. their loved one or, you know, someone's in critical care and um, yeah. they're not sure what the doctor just said to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because- mm -hmm. Uh, it, people yeah. are talking, they're using big words, they're talking quickly, and it can right. be intimidating. Right, for sure. Yeah, and we're going to get into your practice before we leave today. But i uh, got a couple of more things that, with you, as I said, the things that I've never really heard about. For example, 
a doctor who practiced medicine on an Indian reservation. So I, I think most of us don't even know anything about a reservation. So what was it like just being on White River, the Apache uh, Indian Reservation? What was it like just being on the reservation? Oh, it was amazing. It was magical. I was there for two months. Um, as part of your um, training, as part of my training, they have you go to an area health equity center, I think is what it's called, mm -hmm. or community. And they're usually it's somewhere where they don't have as much access to care and or, you know, um, the socioeconomics are challenged or just not as much representation. And you can choose to do it at an IHEC, which is now an Indian Health Educational Center. And that's what I chose to do. Um, that's something I've tried to do all throughout my career. I try to give myself varied experiences because you just never know when you're going to have that experience again. Yeah. And so this was out in the White River Apache Reservation in Arizona. I had never been out there. So it's funny when you say most of us don't know. I will qualify that. It depends on where you live in the country. I mean, in yeah. some parts of the country, there are many Indian reservations, and that's a regular part of, you know, the community here on the East Coast, not not as much. I mean, there's mm, a, there's okay. a few um, where I train down in East Carolina. There's a Hosky. That's a I hack. But there were places all over the country that um, I could go to 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 do this work. And so um, it was phenomenal. They are a beautiful people Um there, a lot of the tri different tribes have some sort of gift. I, this is what I call it. Um, that's part of their tradition and their culture. For them, it was beadwork. So they beaded everything. Um, and that was wonderful. And they treated me. There's a part, there was a part on the reservation where some servicemen um, had settled at, a, at an earlier time. And some of those servicemen were of color. So they were um, fascinated with me. They just like you said, they weren't used to seeing me. So they thought that I was, um, you know, half part of the tribe from that particular area. Um, and I had my hair in braids and they were just fascinated with that. So, um, but you also learned a lot. I mean, like the supermarkets mm -hmm. did not have the same um, variety of foods. You know, there's a lot of statistics that are given in medicine that are honestly quite frustrating to me because they don't tell the full story. You know, they mm -hmm. often talk about, um, we'll talk about people of color having more diabetes or being more obese or um, people who are indigenous uh, having different afflictions. But then when you go there and you realize that they don't have the same resources, you know, mm -hmm. there aren't all, um, there aren't all the different types of foods available that you would get somewhere off of a reservation. And so I just mm -hmm. learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about this country. I learned a lot about um, healthcare. The other thing I will say about the reservation and closing on that is um, I also learned you can do a lot with a little because mm -hmm. we're here in Maryland where if you have a mole, you know, right here, are you gonna have it taken off by derm? Are you going to have it taken off by maxo oral facial? Is it going to be a general surgeon? Like you have literally five subspecialists who can take care of something for you. On the reservation, I remember us resuscitating a person with the pharmacist and the family doc doing the same type of things because they 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 did what they could do with what they had. And mm -hmm. so um it was a beautiful experience. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So now I know that you were trained at, I think it was East Carolina Medical School. Yeah, it's the East Carolina Brody School of Medicine. Okay. Now, am I correct in saying that you were trained as a traditional or a doctor in allopathic medicine? Would yes. that be a fair statement? Yes. Mm -hmm. so help us get an insight into what, what that is, allopathic medicine or traditional medicine. Can you help us understand what that is? Um, it's pretty much our health system, the way it's set up now, it's, you go to medical school for four years, then you can do a residency anywhere from three to nine years, depending on if you're, you know, doing a fellowship and, and things mm -hmm. like that. And, mm -hmm. um, it's a very 
physical, I would say a physical physiology based system of learning Mm -hmm. how to take care of patients. There's a disease process and we learn the underlying process and then we learn treatments for the process. Yeah. And is pharmacology a huge part of being trained in allopathic medicine? For sure. There's a whole year Mm -hmm. of it. We got probably a week on diet. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got Same, you. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. So I asked that because I wanted to establish that foundation. Now help me because it seems to me though that you that you have broadened your scope. That you're not just a doctor trained and you're trained in allopathic medicine, but there are many more things in your wheelhouse. Am I correct in saying that? Absolutely. So so Absolutely. what what prompted you? Because everyone doesn't make the shift. Mm-hmm. Every doctor, the medical doctor doesn't make the shift. So what prompted you to kind of veer into, to broaden your scope mm-hmm. of uh, the way you treat patients? What what prompted you? Is it well, something I, metaphysical again? Yeah, well, <laughs> I've always been attracted to, you know, other things. So I remember going to something called the Whole Life Expo, even mm-hmm. younger, where, you know, you go there and people are talking about chakras and talking about your auras and all these things. I was always kind of like, you know, found those kind of things interesting. And then as time went on and I come from, you know, going back to that grandmother and both my grandmothers were amazing women. Um, They just treated everything with like between Mercuricone, for those you who are young, youngins out there, it was a red, a red medicine that they would put on stuff to take, take the, um, (laughs) <laughs> the infection away, witch hazel. And um, there's one more thing she, my grandmother was really into. Um, Bix Vapor Rub. I feel like she cured everything with those three, th- three things. They were always putting something together and curing something. So I, you know, my father's always been into vitamins and smoothies and healthfulness. He's um, was a cancer patient and survivor at like 20 so he always um, has imparted me the importance of, you know, what you eat and how you take care of your body. And so that that milieu, mixing all that together in, in a gumbo there really was a good foundation for me to know that I wanted more than just, you know, pharmacology um, as a means to help my patients. So what I always say is I was looking when I went to open up my own practice um, back in 2006, I was looking for something other than a prescription pad to help my patients. But I wanted something tried and true. And I have a lot of respect for my allopathic um, education. So I said, well, I've got to find something that's kind of been like stamped or has, you know, some um, street cred from people who have been trained like me. And lo and behold, when I looked that up, I found Dr. James Gordon and he had founded the Center for Mind Body Medicine, which is in Washington, DC. He's been there for 30 years and he is a Harvard trained psychiatrist and, um, you know, served on the president's task force for integrative medicine around that time. A lot was coming out about integrative and complementary medicine in NIH. And um, I started that journey in 2008 and have never looked back, became, wow. um, did my initial coursework in 2008, did my um, advanced coursework in t- 2011, time, life, babies, everything came in. <laughs> and then I went back yeah. to it, um, became certified, um, became faculty, and then became associate clinical director for the center. And I'm no longer associate clinical director, but I'm, I'm still on faculty. And um, and serve as um, the supervisor of supervisors there, and so just was really looking, um, Dr. Middleton, for other tools. And the center, the basis of what my certification is, they I teach um, a trauma informed self care model. Wow. Yeah. And um, we use this model all over the world. We have used this in Haiti and Gaza. We have used this with the people in California who are suffering from the wildfires. 
we have a huge program with Vision 8, which the VAs, their hospitals are uh, sectioned into Visions, and mm-hmm. Vision 8 is the largest uh, Vision in, in the VA. Um, so we use this work with vets. Um, we use this, I use this work one-on-one with soccer moms. I use it, yeah. we use it with incarcerated individuals. And so in my own business, I take that um, that model and I um, adapt it to what people's needs are. And I teach people self-care skills. I really had become kind of burnt out. Well, not mm-hmm. kind of, I had become burnt out on our yeah. current medical system. And I really was looking to help people stay well and help yeah. people. And like you said, empower people with what is within. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, our time together has just flown by. There's so many <laughs> things that I wanted to talk with you about, like total renaissance wellness, for example. And so we got to bring you back. We'll we'll reach out to maybe 2024, you know, late in the year or something like that, which, which we, I hope that you'll be, I'm not going to ask you now, but there's so many other questions that I have for you. I just have enjoyed my time with you uh, immensely. Uh, Dr. Greenwood. So yes, of course, so I will come back. And just so you know, if anyone's interested, my company mm-hmm. is Total Renaissance Wellness. Um, yes. And so that's I that model that I was just talking about and consulting and workshops and retreats. Those are all the things yeah. that I do in my um, own company. I, I like to say I took what I did in the exam room and I took it out of the exam room. And now I help people thrive. And so talk to corporations and all kinds of um, schools and, um, you know, just helping people to get in touch with their own self-care and understanding that brain body connection. I love it. I love it. Well, it has been a, a treat having you with us today. Thank you again. You are so welcome. And thank you for having me. My pleasure. You've been listening to the Possibility Action Network podcast. Our guest today has been Dr. Linda Way Greenwood. I'm your host, Stephen Middleton. Until next time, good day. You are not alone, just keep on.